All right, so, um, yeah, everybody's heard about the Big Bang. The universe began with a Big Bang, in quotes there, between 10 and 20 billion years ago. And uh, why that's in quotes is because actually there's a, uh, that debate amongst scientists about whether there was actually any sound or not. Um, first of all, were sound waves produced or was it just energy waves? And sounds a type of energy, but was that the type of energy wave or how many different types of energy waves were produced and et cetera. Um, and then even if a sound wave is produced, is it sound? If there's not something to receive the sound and interpret it. It's that old thing about if a tree falls in the forest and nobody's there to hear it, does it actually make a sound? Okay, it's that same type of philo philosophical argument debate. So that's why you see that oftentimes in, in quotes, quotation marks, is because we call it a big bang. It was a very um, massive release of energy, okay, uh, and, and so it, it would be like an explosion in that sense, and all explosions that we uh, experience have some type of sound uh, associated. So that's where the idea of a bang came from, okay. All right. Um, a little explanation there of that. So uh, after that event happened, then we have all this interstellar matter that's just out there and it takes time for it to, to coalesce into different things and it developed into stars, planets, different heavenly bodies as we refer to those. And our planet formed from gathering interstellar matter about 4.6 billion years ago is our estimate on that. The first atmosphere of the planet would be mostly hydrogen gas, and we know we we know that from a few things. Okay, um, first of all, we study other. Uh, well, maybe actually, it's second of all, I'll go with this one first though. Um, we study other heavenly bodies. Okay, and when you look back into when you look out into the stars, you're looking back in time because the light that left those stars or reflected off of those bodies if they're planets or asteroids or whatever, when they reach us here, it took them light years to get here, okay? Um, maybe hundreds of light years, maybe thousands of light years, okay, uh, or more. So when that light reaches us, that light left that source that many years ago, okay, light years ago. So um, you're looking back into, into the history of the formation of the universe. And the further out we can see, the further back in time we can see. And we're always expanding our ability to look further out. So it's given us a better picture of, of, of history of the, of the universe. Um, and so one of the things that we can see is that, um, first of all, every element on the periodic table gives off a particular spectrum of light. Okay, and some of that's not, visible light to us, but we can detect it with instrumentation called spectrophotometers, okay, and those uh, those spectra are like signatures, chemical signatures for those things. So hydrogen has a particular spectrum that can be detected, and we can see that on like early planets, okay, young, young planets, and we see that there's a lot of hydrogen gas, and then as planets age, that's not there and sometimes it gets replaced with a second atmosphere, and sometimes it doesn't. Hydrogen gas is uh, hard for, hard, it's held by gravity for a while, but it's hard to hold and hang on to, so it's gonna, it's gonna slowly dissipate over time. Anyway, um, if there's something being produced on that planet to replace it, that can be held by the gravity of that planet, then that may happen. Um, but you also have things that just lose their atmosphere completely and it's gone, and there's no new atmosphere to replace it. Um, so we have that um, evidence to show us that most likely we had a hydrogen gas atmosphere. The other thing that we can look at is the geological record of our own planet. And we can see that there are minerals, uh, there were certain mineral compounds that were formed naturally on the planet at that time that could not form today under natural circumstances because we don't have hydrogen gas present. Those particular compounds would have to be formed under a high hydrogen environment and we can mimic that in the laboratory and show that that's what happens okay that's what it takes to form those things and they don't form today because we don't have that that circumstance the second atmosphere is still not our modern atmosphere okay the second atmosphere that formed is the one that we're most interested in though in looking at how early early life came about because the second atmosphere would have contained water carbon dioxide carbon monoxide so those opposite way they were listed there, okay. Uh, nitrogen gas and methane gas. 
Um, again, we have hydrogen rich gases, but not just hydrogen. Uh, there's ammonia too, it's gonna be talked about later as one of these. Um, again, we're looking at geologic evidence of compounds that were formed on what, have, what would have been the surface at that time uh, that can't be formed under today's atmosphere naturally. But get a chamber, put these components in there and start seeing what forms or if you can form these things. And, and these are the conditions that are required for those compounds to form naturally. Um, we know there was a lot of volcanic activity because we can see that there were there's evidences of a lot of volcanic eruptions at that time all over the planet, um, underwater, as well as on exposed land. Um, we assume there was a lot of lightning because this atmosphere would be a highly charged atmosphere. And also we assume there's a lot of UV radiation coming in from the sun because the atmosphere would not filter any of that out. This is the type of atmosphere that would allow, allow it all through because what filters it out today is ozone and ozone is made of oxygen. And notice there's no oxygen in this atmosphere. We didn't have anything to produce oxygen yet. Okay. Um, oh, there's a question sometimes that's asked. Well, if we have lightning and lightning striking water and there's a lot of water on the planet, there's gonna be oxygen given off because that's what electricity does, that's hydrolysis. You can split water into hydrogen and oxygen by putting electric current through it. So why don't we have oxygen in the atmosphere from all this lightning? And um, the answer to that is that uh, that one single oxygen radical being given off would have been snagged up quickly, <laughs> okay, uh, by other things, possibly even the hydrogens to form it right back into water immediately. Um, singlet, oxygen singlets are um, called, called radicals, free radicals, but they're very um, uh, in high demand, okay, for things. And so the chances of two of them coming together and forming the diatomic element um, that quickly it mean, could happen, but probably not in large, large enough quantity to make a significant impact on the atmosphere. And mostly they were going to be scavenged very quickly by other things just sitting there waiting for an oxygen singlet to be given off, okay? Because this type of atmosphere would have been oxygen hungry, so to speak. Okay, that any, any free carbons <laughs> are gonna be snagging that oxygen really fast. Okay. So this is an artist's rendition of what that early, early earth might've looked like. You got your volcanoes going, you got these uh, underwater volcanic vents bubbling up here, kind of like a hot springs. That's what those hot springs are actually. We have hot springs, that's underground volcano, um, venting steam and heat. Uh, the, these yellow green, uh, things growing here, looking, yeah, growing. Those are supposed to be representations of a uh, cyanobacteria, um, which is an archaebacteria. Uh, we used to classify these as green algae, and you'll hear them sometimes be referred to as blue-green algae, because that's what they were called. They're very, very large cells for bacteria. They do approach the size of a small algae, and they photosynthesize. So before we could really see with a microscope, with really detailed microscope, high-powered microscope into the insides of them to find out that they did not have membrane-bound organelles. Um, they had every outward appearance of being uh, an algae. So they were classified that way for a long time. And uh, sometime probably about the 70s, maybe late 60s, scientists realized that those were not uh, actually uh, algae. And then it was kind of like, well, we got to change their names. So you decide to call them cyanobacteria, which cyan means blue green for you artists, you know that it's a blue green color in your color box. <laughs> okay. Uh, so they kept the name kind of blue green bacteria. Uh, and this is, this is drawn here because this is the single celled organism that we have evidence for being the earliest living thing on this planet. Now that's not to say that it was the first cell, but it's the first one we've got fossil record of, and we have tons of fossil record of it. Um, I'll show you, I've got a couple, couple of slides of different uh, fossils of it. The fossils that we find of this are called stromatolites, okay? But we'll get to those in a little bit. So with this water here, we have all these um, components, the minerals and things that were being dissolved, the heat, um, some of these volcanic vents would have been probably acidic, so you can dissolve minerals out of the rocks that are, are around it, and it creates what uh, is often referred to as primordial soup. And so with all of these chemical components and this primordial soup and this uh, um, 
what's called a reducing environment because we didn't have any corrosive oxygen is corrosive by the way right corrosion it rusts things yeah uh, we didn't have it present then that led to different circumstances than what we have today and so organic molecules could have formed outside of the cell under these circumstances and stanley miller and Harold Urey did an experiment in the 1950s that showed this was possible. They based their work upon uh, work done by two scientists named Aperin and Haldane back in the 1920s, who were organic chemists and showed that certain organic chemicals could have evolved in this kind of this type of environment. Um, they could only form a few things, couldn't go beyond a point um, because the evidence at that time uh, wasn't as much as to what types of things might have existed in that first atmosphere. We learned more about possibilities from the geologic evidence of what could have been in that or that second atmosphere. I need to say second atmosphere. And so that um, allowed uh, Miller and Urey to um, change their gas uh, components and things in the ball. So you saw this in the Cosmos film. Carl Sagan in his Cosmos film had a much larger ball like this and he had the electrodes putting the electricity in there to different and more electricity in different ways. Okay, but this is the apparatus that um, Miller and Uri uh, used first, and this is Stanley Miller here. Um, Carl Sagan actually was Harold Uri's grad student okay, at Cornell. And then when Uri retired, I don't know if there was another person in that position or not, but um, Sagan wound up eventually in Harold Uri's uh, position and carried on the work. And so that's why you see him. Uh, he took us in, into his lab in that film and has this much larger apparatus going on um, with uh, with this. I think some of that was theatrics. I think a little bit of that was just to make it look cool. And it did. <laughs> but anyway, um, so Miller and Uri used water, hydrogen gas, methane gas, and ammonia. So there's your ammonia gas. Okay. Um, these are hydrogen rich gases, obviously, all of them. Water vapor is even a hydrogen rich gas, if you look at it that way. Um, and within days, they were able to see some of the 20 amino acids forming out of this, the, the primordial soup mixture, basically, that they stuck in there and threw electric current through. Um, I'm going to come back to this bottom point here in a little bit. I don't think that link is live anymore. You can check it out if you want, but I think it's I probably needs to be removed. Um, this is a schematic of uh, the Uri Miller apparatus. Uh, experiment is, I think it's, Miller was like the lead scientist, but it's often referred to as Uri Miller. And I think it's because that rolls off the tongue better than Miller Uri. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, for me, it does. Okay. I think I've kind of already said most of that slide. Here's the slide. This is the stromatolite. This is a fossil called a stromatolite. And where you see these dark black layers in between the, the reddish clay type sediment, this is sedimentary rock obviously making this fossil. Um, these are the fossilized remains of these cyanobacteria. And they this grow in, in mats on these rocks on the surface of the water, just around right at surface water and under water. And they're still here today. Um, our, the descendants of these first ones from way back are still alive and going well, and they still photosynthesize and produce oxygen for the planet. Um, they're aquatic. They're not the number one producer of oxygen anymore. Okay, they were the first, but they're not the number one, but we'll get to that in a different topic altogether. Okay, here's kind of a timeline like a clock. If the Earth started here, <laughs> origin of the solar system and Earth right here, then at, at like 4.6 billion years ago, then right here about, what is that? 2.246, yeah, I don't know. Um, over three and a half billion years ago, you've got these first cyanobacteria fossils showing up, okay, and they, lived for a while, produced oxygen. It took a while for them to produce enough oxygen to be a significant component in our atmosphere to where we get atmospheric oxygen. And then from there, we can see single cell eukary eukaryotic organisms coming into being. Um, we could have had all sorts of bacteria 
prior to this, okay, actually, because uh, there's a, a whole grouping of bacteria that don't require oxygen, they're anaerobic. Um, so those could have come, come in here along with the cyanobacteria, most likely did, okay. Um, this is the stepwise idea that scientists are following right now of how the first cell came into being. Um, steps one, two, and three, I have actually described to you, okay, um, about how non-organic molecules in the oceans could, um, could form. And then from those, we get the organic monomers. That's actually the, those are the experiments that, this is number one is the experiment of O'Parin and Haldane. And then building on that, kind of confirmed by Miller and Uri. And then number two, done by, um, number two and three actually both done by uh, Miller and Uri and Sagan, okay, uh, getting these polymers formed. So now Sagan took it further. He talks about that in the film that he didn't get just amino acids forming um, in, in his lab with his experiment. And, and he was probably still working in conjunction with Miller and and because uh, I think Miller uh, uh, was around a lot longer, um, working on this. So together, they, other scientists, I'm sure, this is always team effort, um, got not just some amino acid chains forming, not some polypeptides, but um, he actually talks about simple proteins being formed. Okay, that's, that's big. Um, nucleic acids, okay, nucleotide monomers being formed and then nucleotides, some very simple nucle nucleic acid chains being formed. Somebody wants in. <laughs> okay. All right. So we can do this. This has been done uh, in the laboratory uh, under the circumstances we think existed on early Earth. The catch right now, unless something has happened um, that I haven't read about yet, which is possible, okay, um, the catch right now is getting between step three and step four and being able to explain, hey, here's how the first cell came into being. Um, and so in the film, um, you know, Sagan had the little, the uh, animation there about life, the evolution of life, and he had the drawings and how things changed into one thing into another type of thing um, over time. And the first thing starts off with a single cell and you see the little membrane form, okay. Um, he draws that membrane as a double layer phospholipid membrane. Okay, and uh, that's the problem right now, as far as I know. Scientists have not been able to get that double layer to form in a laboratory situation. We can get a single layer to form. Any high school student that's, that, that, whose teacher can get the phospholipids from Carolina Biological or anywhere else can do this, okay? And um, Sally Finska used to have her students do it. I don't know if she still does or not because I haven't talked to her about the specific lab, but she's the first one who told me about it because we weren't doing it back when I was in high school when I was her student, but later um, she was having her students do it. You take a solution of phospholipids, we'll look under the microscope, you pipette those into a drop of water on the microscope and they're gonna circle the wagons. Okay, those tails do not like water. They're gonna flip in, the heads are gonna flip out to kind of protect them, seal them off from the water. It, it, you got a membrane, <laughs> okay, but it's a single layer membrane, not a double layer. Um, and so those little things are that scientists refer to them as micelles, M-I-C-E-L-L, -L, micelle. And uh, that's, that's great and it's easy. Okay, so we know that that property exists and we know the phospholipids will do that. What we don't know is what instigates them to have that other layer inside so that you can have water inside the cell, okay? Because if you can't have water inside, so if you just got tails sticking in there, <laughs> there's no room for anything else. There's no room for nucleic acids, which you've got to have. Got to have DNA, RNA, something. So uh, what conditions would, would trigger that formation? And that, as far as I know, that's the question that's being studied right now and has been for a number of years as to try to figure out what conditions were needed to develop that. Well, what about this electricity? We assume there's lightning. We have evidence for volcanoes. We can't really have evidence for lightning other than the fact that, well, those gases usually are charged, have a charge, you know, that sort of thing. We don't have to have the lightning actually to get these things happening. Um, scientists have found that if you take, you can take hot rocks or clay uh, kind of, and, and, you know, put on it, heat them up in a laboratory. 
Okay, and if you take solutions of these same chemicals that they've got in the ball with the electricity going through it, you take solutions of these same things, put them on these hot rocks or hot clay slabs, um, polymerization, ha polymerization happens. Okay, um, it's polymerization is a dehydration synthesis. I showed that to you in the chemistry section in the chemistry chapter. Um, when two amino acids join together to form a peptide bond, water is really given off as a result of it. <laughs> Um, same thing with the fatty acids joining onto the uh, to glycerol to make a triglyceride. Uh, it's a dehydration synthesis. So um, almost all of these polymerization type reactions are a dehydration synthesis. And all you need is a hot rock. <laughs> okay. If we've got lots of volcanoes all over the planet, which evidence shows there were, you're going to have a lot of those steam vents. You're going to have a lot of hot rocks. And you're going to have hot, hot rocks under the water where all these things are dissolved in the water. Okay, so it appears that the conditions were just perfect, okay, for all this stuff to have happened. So again, another uh, one of the things that uh, was in the Cosmos film that Carl Sagan tagged on at the end in the you know, extra 10 minutes that he filmed like 10 years later. He talks about two things that have changed since the filming in, in knowledge at that time. And one was about the asteroids and the dinosaurs. The second one was about RNA. And that at 10 years later, the predominant thought was, and really still is at this point, um, that RNA was probably the first genetic material. Um, that's because it's the simplest and uh, it's the simplest explanation. Uh, so in science, another, there's a logic test called um, Occam's razor. And that's named after a um, English Bishop of Occam. And I think he lived in the Renaissance time period. I'm not uh, sure exactly of his dates. I haven't read about him or thought about him in a long time. I'm pretty sure he's a Renaissance kind of thinker. Uh, and he proposed that as a, as a test. Uh, if your explanation is getting too complex, then it's probably not the best one. It's probably not what really happened. So science is used that uh, for a long time. It's saying if, 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 if you have to put that in there too much, well, if this, then maybe this, if, then, and kind of, sort of, and uh, too complex. So we want to look at the simplest thing because the simplest thing is, is probably what happened. And so RNA has the ability to um, make proteins without DNA, right? In fact, DNA has to have RNA to make the proteins. I just walked you through that Friday, right? So here, in order to have life, as, as we know it today, with everything on this planet being coded by DNA, we have to have both DNA and RNA nucleic acids forming. But RNA can make act as its own enzyme, actually, to replicate itself. It can also code for those proteins all by itself without having to go through any extra step, any extra duplication step or anything like that. So it really is the simplest explanation. And so that's why a lot of scientists uh, have adopted the idea of the RNA world as what early Earth would have been like and the first living things on the planet would have had RNA. Now, why did DNA replace it? Um, I, I've read that for some reason DNA seems to be a little more stable, okay, as a blueprint. but um, there's also right now, I read uh, an article just, oh, maybe I think back over Christmas where some scientists are beginning to question this idea of the RNA world, but I don't know why they're questioning it because the article didn't go into that. And I will just take this opportunity to remind you that scientists are supposed to question everything. It's like, well, this, this idea is getting too popular. Everybody's getting on this bandwagon. Should we be? <laughs> type of thing. Let's, let's question it. Let's think about it. Um, and that's good because it, it puts scientists through the process of kind of confirming why, they, why they're thinking this way and is there another option. So um, anyway, that, like I said, is, is the um, still the leading idea of the first nucleic acid. Um, and viruses still use it. They're not living, but you've got, remember, four types of viruses. We've got DNA and RNA, but we've got DNA single-stranded, DNA double-stranded, RNA single-stranded and RNA double-stranded. So even though we don't consider viruses living, they do use RNA, some of them use RNA as their genetic blueprint, okay, without having a DNA uh, um, blueprint. 
And of course, if they're going to insert themselves into a living cell, then they actually have to make the DNA, turn them, you know, replicate themselves to DNA, uh, which they do. But um, they still use the RNA blueprint. So there's evidence that that could have existed because it still does there. Um, these slides here kind of repeat what I've just said. So you can look at those are kind of illustrations of that sort of thing. So this is a drawing of uh, like the first cell. Uh, once we got that <laughs> double membrane, then the RNA would have been inside. Some simple polypeptides could have been inside. And that would be all you'd need in a very simple, very simple cell. It's all you need. OK, so let's talk more about that plasma membrane. Um, this is the boundary of the cell that regulates the passage of molecules into and out of the cell. It is a phospholipid bilayer with protein molecules embedded within but scattered throughout the lipid, and therefore it's referred to as the fluid mosaic model. So we're using the term model again. And if you remember right, when I talked to you about the DNA, uh, I showed you the picture of Watson and Crick with their, their tinker toy and, and you know, uh, ring stand <laughs> model that I, I just love this picture because it shows the creativity of scientists and, and the fact that we have to have models because when we're studying something so small that we can't see it really and with the naked eye and we can't manipulate it with our hands, we've got to put it into a, a, a size that we can visualize and deal with and work with. So um, a, lot of our, a lot of our cell modeling is now done with CGI and uh, um, that's just because we can manipulate on the screen better. That film that you watched, the virus film, was all CGI. And see, that's something that they were depicting stuff that's even hard to see under a pretty high-powered microscope uh, in a way that was very visually engaging for you, hopefully, so that you could see it and understand it um, rather clear clearly. Um, so models are important, again, emphasizing that. Um, scientists need them to use them. So why do we have a model of something like a cell? Don't we know everything about a cell? And we don't. We, we know a lot. <laughs> okay, we know a lot about the cell and the cell functions. But there are some functions that we aren't completely clear on how they happen or why they happen, when they happen, or the way they happen. And then there are also some things we recognize that we may not even know the cell's doing. Okay, so it's, it's still a work in progress. So therefore, it's a model can be modified and adjusted at any time with new information. The phospholipid bilayer and the proteins, um, this fluid consistency, I'm going to draw out some cell membrane here in a little bit and uh, a representation of and a model of. And you will see uh, what I'm talking about with fluid it means things can move. And then the proteins that are scattered in there give it a, a mosaic appearance because it's not all uniform. It's, speckled with other things. A mosaic in art is made up of you know, different types of components, like a rock mosaic, make a picture out of different colors of rocks and types of rocks, OK, as an example. Uh, so we'll get onto that. And again, you saw that in the film. On the virus film, you had the, the outside membrane when the virus was attaching to one of those proteins. Those proteins were kind of moving around on that surface a little bit, OK? Everything seemed to be slightly in motion, kind of back and forth and around. And that was that's depicting that fluid and the dotted mosaic character. Okay, each phospholipid molecule has a polar uh, polar head and nonpolar tail, hydrophobic, hydrophobic, hydrophilic. I went over that with you in chapter two chemistry, so um, I'm not gonna read that again. I thought I, I'm trying to delete this mess out of here I made earlier when I was doing something with my my drawing pad and it didn't go away. Um, twice now I've tried to get rid of it. <laughs> I'm not succeeding. Okay, so these are terms that I'm going to go over here as I draw the membrane example. And so I'll just leave those here for you to read. And I'll come back to them. So now it's time to switch to that drawing pad. Okay, so everybody's seen uh, just the big white screen on on your on your screen. Yes. Good. 
great. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to start off with just some basic um, possible lipids. And I keep saying this to everybody, normally, um, or what used to be normal, I would have this on a short answer test. And so you would have to draw something like this yourself on a test and label it. And I now have converted all this to kind of multiple choice type questions. Okay, but I still want you to have a visual, um, you know, of how to draw it or kind of draw it. So what I would ask is I'd say to draw a, a phospholipid. Well, actually I actually just asked you to draw a cell membrane and to label the parts. And I kind of left it open at that because I'd go over this with the students, okay? Um, so if you drew this much, you had to draw the bilayer. And if you labeled the head as the hydrophobic, I'm sorry, hydrophilic head, okay? And the tail here, one of the, pick one of the tails and draw a line to it and say it's a, it's a hydrophobic tail. Okay, that got you three points. Okay, the drawing and, and two labels. <laughs> okay, got you, got you three points. Then after that, there was a lot of bonus <clears throat> for all these proteins and things. And that's that's what we're gonna go into here is the proteins. So I'm gonna start with, I'm just gonna, oops, I didn't change color. Can draw a couple of different types of proteins and I'll come back and label them with you. And again, this is a model. This is just representation so we can talk about it. Explain what these do somewhat. Oh, didn't mean to connect those. Okay. Okay, good enough, I think. All right, so um, if I add a few things here, so this is a normal phospholipid, but if I were to come to one of these phospholipids and I were to draw, can you see that yellow? Is that too light on the white? Does it work? Yes, no. <laughs> Got it. Okay, great. Thanks. All right. Um, so this is a carbohydrate chain. It's going to have some oxygen thrown in there somewhere in addition to the hydrogens. Okay, but um, any anytime you add a carbohydrate chain to a phosph phospholipid like this, you turn it into something called a glycolipid, and that is your first definition on the slides that I said I was going to show you. It's kind of skipped over. So glycolipid. Okay. All right. And then this is out of order. So I'm going to, I'm going to do it out of order on this, this one here. If I come down here and do the same thing, let me, I don't want the chains that close together. Let me put it over here. 
If I do the same thing to a protein, putting some type of chain on it, okay, that's going to become a, yeah. Glycoprotein. It's one word. There's not a space there. Glycoprotein. So you get the idea is glyco in front is connected to having this carbohydrate chain on it. Okay. What the um, what these glycoproteins do is they're embedded all over the surface of the cell and they give your cell identity okay um so your uh, when a cell first divides it is just an animal cell i mean a human animal cell okay uh, and it has a little bit of an identity crisis there for a moment when it divides into two new daughter cells those two new daughter cells they don't know what they are um they're they're a human cell now actually it's not completely wide open because only stem cells can become anything. Um, and then even some stem cells are still, depending on type of stem cell, can be limited as to what they can become. And your tissue cells are, are limited also. They're even more so limited, but they still, most of them still have some options as to what they're going to be, um, you know. Uh, and of course, in your tissues, you've got different types of cells. Okay, so like in a heart, you've got different types of heart. Of cells in your heart. Well, which cell is, am I going to be? And they take this, so this little moment of identity crisis. They take their identity from the cells around them. And that's that's where these glycoproteins come into play. That that's they're going to form. Okay. And that tells the body, hey, I am this type of cell. And also it has a uh, indicator that it belongs to you. It's not a foreign cell. Okay. Your immune system recognizes that and won't attack, providing your immune system is working properly, won't attack your own cells that way. Um, so this is often referred to as your cellular fingerprint. Okay, if you've ever heard that term, cellular, cellular fingerprint, that's what it's talking about. It's talking about the patterns of these, of these glycoproteins um, uh, in your cell. So these play a role in organ transplants. I think I may have talked about that earlier. I don't know, but uh, in chemistry, but um, they're if the body doesn't recognize it, that's going to attack it. And that's a good thing if you've got a bacteria in your system. You know, you've got a virus in your system. They've got the protein spikes. If that's not recognized as as your fingerprint, it's going to get attacked. Um, foreign cells like little parasites and things like that are going to get attacked and destroyed. But in an organ transplant. You know, they try to match you as close as possible, but nobody is an identical match. So they usually give immunosuppressant drugs to help reduce the immune system's functionality for a while. And the idea is that as cells, as new cells in that organ form, they will take the identity from the cells around them, and that'll be some of your cells. And then uh, also, um, maybe your immune system will also adapt a little bit. So kind of a little bit of adaptation here, a little bit of adaptation there, we compromise in the middle, hopefully, and it works. Um, and so that's where 